Hey everybody. In a few days I start my solo skydive course and I thought back to when I was 29. I had a well-paying job. The thought crossed my mind that there might be something more interesting to do in life than be where I was at the time. So I decided I was going to start my own company. I did it without a lot of thinking. And over the years, I've come to the conclusion that if I knew what I knew now, all of the potential downfalls, I probably would not have done it. And I think skydiving is the same. But for me, being attached to somebody else, it, it wasn't going to go quite far enough in terms of you know, me being in control. And the way to do that is this progressive freefall course in Montreal. So I'm gonna be with some really good instructors who are going to teach me the ins and outs. So there's no question I'm going to be terrified most of the time, but I think any sane person who jumps out of a plane uh, without fear, I, I would definitely be questioning their mental capacity. <laughs> Hey babe, I just got here. I am 20 minutes early, so that's good. Looks uh, pretty cool, so I'm going to try to take some videos. It's just uh, raining a bit here. Um, it's sunny everywhere except right here where it's raining. Um, <laughs> if you get a chance, uh, the only thing I wasn't sure about breakfast tomorrow was whether we have to order it tonight or we can order it tomorrow morning. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that works. Anyway, hopefully your work is going good. Bye-bye. Many hours later. <sighs> All right. Tell me. How was that? <laughs> Please, I want to know. The facility at Parachute Montreal is awesome, but it was a lot of information in a short amount of oh time. Oh my God, I can imagine. <laughs> it so, was total how many hours? Uh, it, it was supposed to be about four hours. I think it wound up being maybe three hours and 45 minutes, three and a half hours, somewhere around there. There were six of us plus the instructor. The first thing you do is you go to the reception. They give you all of the paperwork to fill out, all of the waivers, who to contact. You do the COVID screening. What is the COVID screening? You need a health check. Do you have a fever? Do you have a headache? Oh, have okay. Lost a... okay, it's not a proper test. No, anything. they do take your temperature like with a contactless thermometer. They did the same thing at Parachute Ottawa. And we met the instructor and within, I would say two minutes of meeting the instructor, we were all had parachutes handed to us. And they're kind of heavy, maybe 20, 25 pounds. We're gonna have to fact check this, this stuff, but it was like heavy enough that you need two hands to hold on to it. They call it a rig, a parachute rig. So you get it handed, you set it on the bench, and you start looking at all of the components of the parachute. They say you start from the top to the bottom, and then you do the front to the back. The first thing you do before you do anything else, there's a little computer chip, or a little computer, called an ADD. You might have to look up what ADD stands for, but it's automatic deployment something or other. If all else fails, this thing will open the parachute at 700 feet. So if for whatever reason you haven't been able to deploy your main chute, reserve chute, then this little computer chip deploys the reserve chute at 700 feet. But by itself? By itself. It's a little thing that looks like about the size of a USB stick. So that's the first thing that you look at when you're checking all of your stuff. Then you check all of the straps and the harnesses, make sure that all of the connecting rings and there's a, a bunch of cables involved. Then you're just looking for wear and tear and to make sure it's all there. Then you flip up the back of the parachute and there's a, a special kind of a pin that is you know, kind of central to the whole thing. So it needs to be in place. And one thing I didn't know there's a little marker put there. It's almost a magnet and it's connected to the back of the parachute. And that tells you 
that a professional pack the parachute. Then you look at the bottom of the parachute, then you put your legs in. It's got two leg harnesses, and then it's like a backpack. So you put you know, the backpack on, and it's got a, a strap across your chest. It feels like it should be super tight. And you need it, uh, your chest strap a little bit loose because in the air, the proper skydive posture is with your back arched. So if it's already tight, you can't arch your back enough. Okay, makes sense. The legs are, are, are kind of tight. Since we were all men there, they made special note to make sure all of your parts are not anywhere near the straps. It would hurt a lot. It would hurt a lot, he <laughs> says from experience. So, oh, from experience, yes. oh my god. <laughs> so he said, be very careful. And his suggestion was, don't wear jeans. He okay. said, jeans are very bad for keeping male parts in places where they shouldn't be, or tight shorts. So he said, you kind of want to wear looser fitting pants. So from there, we went out to the place where they packed the parachutes. Mm -hmm. And he laid the parachute on the ground. He actually attached it to the wall you know, by hooks. And then he went through the deployment of the parachute in slow motion. There's like a, a small, what they call pilot chute. And that's what you deploy first. Okay. And that chute creates enough friction with the air to pull the main compartment of the parachute open. So it's not the parachute, it's a container. It's called a container. And the parachute is inside the container, which is like your laptop bag inside a backpack mm -hmm. and then it's got enough force that it pulls the parachute out of the container uh, at that point mm -hmm. and then all of the ropes that connect the the parachute canopy to your harness these are called lines so okay. they call them lines the uh, ropes they call but they're, lines. yeah they're, okay. which is okay. the same on a boat they, they don't call them ropes they call them lines but he he pulled it all out then he went through some of the things like okay if the lines get all twisted and he like twisted up the backpack and he said okay we'll see how it's all twisted if you hold on to the lines like the group of lines and put them together and then you spin your feet in the opposite direction it's like being on a swing when you're a kid hmm. and you know you, you twist the you know the swing all the way up and then if you like start the momentum to go the other way it all untwists so you're kind of pulling them apart at the same time if that happens that will not happen that, that may not happen but if it does now we know what to do then from there we actually went on the plane it was on the land okay. they were putting gas in at the time for the next group to go up but we all went in we sat down and we went over putting your seat belt on 1500 feet you take your seat belt off at 4,000 feet, you start mentally going through your jump procedure, your skydive. At 8,000 feet, you have a discussion with your instructor to go over your mental process as to how it's all going to go down. But there is like a process, like a step-by-step, -step, what you need to do internally at each, how it is. Yes, and at each, yes, so at each height. So you, you first do it in your own mind. So after you've done that, then you actually have a discussion with your instructor. So you're repeating, but you're, you're talking out loud with the instructor. Then at 10,000 feet, you do uh, an equipment check. They have something called a four point equipment check. The four things are you need to check your straps to make sure you're still strapped in. You need to check the breakaway, the release, a piece of fabric on your right hand side. It's like a release that you would grab onto and that cuts away your parachute. Oh, that's the release the parachute. That actually. releases the parachute if there's some sort of a problem. Okay. And then on your left side, there's a metal handle and that deploys your, your reserve parachute. You're the fourth one is what they call the main parachute deployment, the pilot chute. Handle is, you know, not messed up or not in a bad position. Then you ask somebody else to lift up the back of your parachute to make sure that that little pin is in the right position. It hasn't, you know, been jostled when you're on the plane, because if that one goes out, your chute could deploy before you want it to. Okay. Yeah, so you do those four checks and you actually wind up doing those, those checks at three different times. Mm -hmm. You do it when you first get the equipment, you do it again in the pre-boarding zone, and then you do it in the plane at 10,000 feet. So then we got out of the plane at that point and we went to this little platform that kind of simulates 
the doorway of the plane. So one instructor is outside the plane, you are in the doorway, the other instructor is still in the plane. But how someone is outside and you are in the middle? So they're, they have a step on the outside. So yeah, they're going, the yeah, so they're, they're totally outside the plane holding on to, I think it's the wing. There's a sequence that you get ready so that everybody knows that you're about to, to go out. So we were on this little platform with this cutout of the doorway that's the same size. Okay. And we practiced four or five times the process of exiting the plane. Everybody does it the same way so that the instructors all know that it's all going to happen at that time. So it's kind of like a, a ballet, you know, it's, it's all synchronized. And then we went back into the building, got down on the floor on our stomachs, mm -hmm. and we practiced the, uh, the flying position. Okay. And the reaching back to the main parachute, we looked at that. Just try to, you know, to get into the right arched position as, you know, as we go. So we practiced that for a little while. Then we started back to the malfunctions. Oh my God. So we had these practice harnesses on. They were just the same straps in the same location. No backpack, just the straps and just the two emergency procedures, safety, things that you pull on each side. The instructor told us, if you have this problem, you have this emergency procedure. Mm -hmm. If you have this problem, you have this emergency procedure. And some of them we... This we, one you said that you need to twist. Yes, one like of one of them, those right? is one of them that can fix. Uh, another common one, the parachute is divided up into sections and sometimes the ones on the outside don't inflate. Oh. There's an emergency procedure on how to try to fix that before you get to the real emergency procedure. Mm -hmm. Then there's a whole bunch of things that can happen where you don't try to fix anything. It's not going to happen. You just go immediately to the emergency procedure. We spent probably the most time, I would say, at least half an hour straight of making the same seven or eight movements in the situation where you have to release your main sh parachute and deploy your reserve chute and just repeat 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 and the instructor was there and the thing that he was really focused on was it's not like a you know all over the place it's methodical it's slow but it's uh, efficient apparently the time between when you might have to do this and when you would possibly hit the ground could be at, at 25 seconds so if you take three or four seconds to do all of this stuff instead of you know one or two, you still have like plenty of time. So you're just doing the same things over and over and over again. Show me. Okay, so essentially uh, the way you describe it is you deploy your main parachute, which is on your right hand side, grab onto the handle and you throw it out. Okay. That deploys that pilot parachute which is the first thing that pulls out the container and then the container opens up to, uh, to have the parachute. So you do that and the first thing you do is look up. This was interesting because when I went on the first tandem jump, I didn't look up at all. I, I didn't see the parachute. I couldn't tell you what color it was. <laughs> I was just looking down or looking straight ahead. The second time I did look up because I wanted to see, I wanted to see the parachute. As soon as you feel the parachute deploy it feels like you're going up but it really just means you slow down very very fast then you look up and you're looking to see the shape of the parachute to make sure it's square it's not twisted around it's actually deployed and there's a little piece of fabric and it's actually called a slider that when the parachute deploys it starts at the top of the parachute and then it slides down the lines to the bottom and it's an indicator that everything is okay. And one of the problems, one of the malfunctions, is that this could stop halfway or stay at the top. And there's a way to, to fix this. If you look up and you know there's no parachute or it's twisted or there's lines around or you know it's just the container or just the pilot chute, then you know that you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem that you probably won't be able to fix. I can't steer and I can't put the brakes on to flare, which is essentially pulling down on these two handles 
and it slows your descent at the very last second so you don't hit the ground there, then it's not going to be any good to you. So first thing that you do before you do anything is you look down at the fabric hold and that's the one that cuts the reserve chute away. So you look down, you find it, then you put the, your right hand on it and then you put your left hand on it. Then before you rip it up, you look at the metal handle, which is the deployment. So you're not looking at this one anymore, you're looking at this one because if you tear the main chute away, you could spin or tumble or something like that. You might lose track of where it is. Then you rip it up and it's connected by Velcro and then you push it down. And that releases your main parachute. And you start to fall again. And then you start to fall again, which is why you spend the time afterwards looking at this one. Then you stick your thumb in this metal and hold on to it. Put your right hand over your left and push down. And that deploys your secondary chute. Then you can reach up and you grab your little handles that are called toggles and then you can steer the reserve parachute. It's not that many steps, but you need to do them in the correct order and you need to do them slowly and methodically so that you don't you know, wind up missing anything. It's pretty simple when you're doing that on the ground, but if you're flying, if you're falling, and it's pretty hard, I think. And <laughs> yes, because you could possibly be spinning and but we practiced it, we practiced it, we practiced it a lot. Then we went over a few scenarios that apparently don't happen very often. And this is where you might have both the main parachute and the reserve parachute deployed at the same time. And this can happen because that little device, the ADD device, if for whatever reason you, you didn't pull your main parachute in time or you pulled it too late, then maybe that kicks it in and you wind up with both. Sometimes, once again, it doesn't happen very often, but when you deploy the main parachute, it jolts you a little bit and that may be enough to release the reserve parachute. If you had two parachutes, there can be one in front of the other, they can be side by side, or they can be counter opposing one another, then there's no problem. The only problem is you can't, you can't steer them back to where you need to go. You just are essentially looking for a big open space to land. But you land very slowly because now you, you have two parachutes slowing you down. He made a little bit of a joke saying, if you have two parachutes out, you might as well enjoy the view because you're gonna be in the air a long time, a long time, a long time. A long time. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no, 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 no! You can steer them just a tiny bit to maybe avoid an obstacle like a tree or a fence or something like that, but you can't steer it back to the airport. You're just looking for a big open area and essentially you're gonna get carried by the wind mm -hmm. in whichever the direction the wind is going. So we did that and... No, 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 come back. Okay. When it's chill like this and when they are counterposed, what do you do? Yeah, so when they're, when they're counter, countering one another, they're spread apart. So that means that you can release the main parachute because you're gonna start spiraling very fast down. Oh, that's what happens, okay. Yeah. But because they're apart, they won't get tangled together, so you can release one. If you try to release them when they're side by side or one on top of the other, then there's a chance that they could become entangled with one another, so it's better to leave them in that configuration. But if they start spiraling you down very quickly, they're separated enough that you go through the emergency procedure of cutting away the main chute, and then you're just left with the reserve. Then you can steer it uh, as normal. The last thing that we did was the landing patterns. So you deploy your main parachute at 5,000 feet, and then you have the time that it takes you to get from 5,000 feet to 900 feet. So when you get to 900 feet, you need to begin your landing process. The way you do that is you go downwind. So you're looking at the ground. They have a wind sock that tells you the direction of the wind, and you know this before you get on the plane, mm -hmm. uh, where which direction the wind is coming from and where you're going to lose all of your altitude, they call it like the play area where you're doing twists and turns and you know, just kind of enjoying the scenery. So from 900 feet to 600 feet, you go downwind. 
Then depending on the wind direction, you make a 90 degree turn across the wind to, you know, to wind up at 300 feet. And then three, when you get to 300 feet, you make your final turn and then you go directly into the wind for those last 300 feet. Hopefully landing in the landing zone. When you get to 12 feet above the ground, and I'm not sure other than being able to visualize that you're 12 feet above the ground, plus you have the support of a radio in your ear with an instructor on the ground telling you to flare or put the brakes on. And it's a kind of a gradual process where you start above your head like this and you pull down. And the closer you get to the ground, the faster you need to pull or you just make it a nice smooth movement. But the instructor is there on the ground. So if they say flare, 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 you're going slow. If for whatever reason they start saying flare, 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 then you go all the way to the bottom. As long as you don't get hurt at the end, it's a good landing. Ideally, you want to land in the landing zone. But any time that you get to the ground without running into anything, even if it's one field over, whew, I have to learn to land closer to where I need to be at the end. These long walks are killing me. Everybody else has landed, packed their parachute, gone for lunch, and I just show up at the end. In this place, they have these huge fields of corn all around, and the instructor said, corn is going to be a softer landing than picnic tables. <laughs> so they have a whole bunch of picnic tables there to have your lunch and kind of view the parachutes coming down. He said, if you have the choice between the corn and the picnic tables, the corn will be softer. So after we did that, uh, we had a test at the end. It was about 40 questions testing all of the, the, the things that we had covered in the course. A written one. A right? written one, and then the instructor grades the test. As a group, you go over all of the answers, make sure everybody is you know, fully, uh, fully aware. Luckily, I passed, oh. <laughs> which was great. Did um, you miss any? Uh, I had, uh, there were a couple, because there's so much information. Like You need to be knowledgeable of the altitudes on the way up on the way down for the safety procedures you need to implement certain things if you get to a certain altitude some of the processes are seven eight steps long the idea is this is the theoretical anyway it's a small part of the overall course it's four hours now it's on to the practical uh, which is you know a series of 10 jumps with instructors a lot more things to learn and to put all of that theory into practice so we start tomorrow at 10 a.m we're gonna get a good night's sleep and we're gonna have a good breakfast and then we're gonna be ready to go at 9 30. after taking the theoretical course i feel more confident and that's the feeling that i wanted to have um, at this point the spectator area is very close to the landing zone. Okay, don't land. I on will. Me. That's what I said. Don't <laughs> land in the picnic tables. Go to the corn. <laughs> nice. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs>